So, good morning everyone. My name is Alana Fitzgerald. I'm going to talk to you today about my graduate research into resources at the interface of openness for academic English. So I'll just go to the next slide and tell you about the aims of my research. Um, so I'm particularly interested in resources development for academic English, how we can support learners with academic English in formal and as well as um, informal education. So there's an issue with um, defining what openness means in that broader context, because um, I'm not only looking at OER developed by teachers per se, I'm looking at open tools for linguistic analyses uh, developed by open source software developers, and I'm looking at things like open access publications that can be used as well. But I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, I'm interested also in awareness raising and uptake of these types of tools for linguistic analyses because um, to date they haven't really become mainstream within regular mainstream language teaching and learning. They've sort of resided more in the domain of research related to corpus linguistics. And through my research, through a, an analysis process called um, interface analysis, looking at what might have um, enhanced the uptake of these tools and what might have actually created barriers. Um, so we'll just progress from here. So these are the communities that my research is interfacing. There are quite a few. Um, I myself am an English for academic purposes teacher. Um, that's my background. Um, before that, I was a general English language teacher, uh, teaching mainly everyday conversation. And then I switched my focus to teaching more writing and um, lexis or vocabulary and patterns related to domain-specific language learning across the different um, subject areas. Um, I'm also working with these um, open source software developers who are also computer scientists in New Zealand with a project called the Flax Language Project. So I'm part of that project now. So that's probably my primary research and design um, context of research. And today I'll be telling you a little bit about research that I've done already. I'll be showing you some qualitative data and research that I'm doing at the moment within the context of MOOCs and also within traditional English for academic purposes teaching. Okay, so because there is a lot of focus on the development of tools and resources, um, the methodology for my research that I've chosen is design-based research. I chose this for the obvious design aspect, but also action research is very well used within language teaching research. It's not too different from design-based research. Um, Terry Anderson describes it as action research on steroids. I think that's a really nice quotation. Um, and what the differences would be is that within design-based research, there's more of a focus on collaborative um, research participation rather than the action research model, which, is, which tends to be focused on um, individual practitioners reflecting on their teaching practice. And it's mainly classroom-based as well. Um, and I think maybe what's missing in the action research cycle is the documentation of design processes. So that's a big part of design-based research. Returning to research contexts, returning to research um, design and development artifacts, and reiterating those, and finding out you know, what's new, what needs to be changed, um, and updated, and so on. And then releasing as well um, into different media formats and also across different communities. So I'm going to tell you about two case studies I did in the UK. Uh, well, both based through UK universities. One of them was more internationally focused with Oxford, and one of them was more locally focused at Durham, which is in the northeast of England. And, uh, and then I'm going to tell you about two research contexts that I'm actually focusing on now for my PhD research um, in particular. So research through mistakes. I like to think that that's how it's been for me as well. Um, just learning through doing and figuring out as you go along. And it's been a wonderful journey. It's probably taken me a lot longer than I thought it would, um, but um, it's definitely helped my, it's radically changed my practice actually. 
this methodology and also working with the open source community and the OER community. I have become an open educational practitioner. I never used to be one, so it's, um, it's a good thing. Um, this is an image I found on Flickr, um, which I think sort of outlines a lot of the processes within design-based research. It doesn't include the documentation stage, um, but I think that's generally what tends to happen. I'm going to um, oops, just focus on the prototyping area here, um, because that's hugely um, important within the open source software community as well. Putting things up on the web before they're ready um, to get other people to help you to develop them further. That's, that's something that, that we've been looking at as well. Okay, social interface theory. If anybody's actually had any experience doing research with this methodology, um, I'd be really interested to hear from you because this is something I found because I am working with the developers in terms of de developing interfaces for software, so that's a very practical um, approach to inter interfaces. However, I'm also interested in this social interface theory um, where it's looking at critical junctures where um, people, their communities, their values, their resources are actually creating an interface. And sometimes that's a positive outcome in terms of being able to progress forward in terms of the design for resources, and sometimes it's not so not so um, fruitful. Okay, so this um, is an image of Flex. Uh, a lot of people, when I tell them about the Flex lang language project, um, I always tell them to look up Flex language in Google, otherwise you're going to come up with a plant or flaxseed oil if you just put in flax. Um, so that's how we get to it. Um, what we're trying to do with flax is really design linguistic tools and resources for the language learner and for the language teacher, not for the corpus um, researcher. Because a lot of tools out there have been developed in a very complex way that's not so accessible um, for your average teacher or learner. The researchers will claim that they are useful, but there haven't actually been any um, interface and usability studies done that can actually evidence that. And I think just from my own experience, from, from being a teacher and working with learners, I know that there was a need to make simple interfaces. So here we've got an interface, well, as simple as we can get it, which has, um, the search term was virology, and, and what Flax does, it, it will sort it into language pa patterns, and then it's going to find how that word virology is being used as a noun, um, as an adjective plus virology. And then it's linked to larger data sets. So it's linked here to related words. Now what's behind this interface is a very large Wikipedia in English database of 200 million articles in English. So that's going to throw up through um, an algorithm what words tend to occur or co-occur with virology across the large corpus. So that's giving students an idea of how the word is used. Um, and you can click down into deeper levels and it gives you the words and context of how they're used. But also other words and other topics in Wikipedia and definitions from Wiktionary to give you a, a much more comprehensive resource um, on, for that term virology. So how is that term virology used across a lot of contexts? That's, this is a traditional um, corpus interface, or what we call a concordance uh, for looking for the same word virology. And these, this is a typical what we call keyword and context interface. And there we see the word virology in context. Now, the corpus linguists who develop this type of concordancing software, they just thought, well, language learners can figure out what the patterns are, right? Um, but I, I tend to disagree. You might be able to if you spend a lot of time, um, but you would need some training, I would think, and, um, and quite a good knowledge already of the language that you're trying to learn as well. Okay, so a couple of years ago, I put out this post on my blog, uh, going along the lines of Queen's Radio Gaga, 
corpus based resources, you've yet to have your finest hour, because I see that we can make more user friendly corpus tools and resources. And why not use them in online learning as well as just classroom based learning? And there's nobody doing research on, you know, using these types of tools for informal learning. They're all very traditional university focused classroom based studies. So there were lots of opportunities that I thought could be exploited. And I use the metaphor of radio because once again, I was sort of tuning into different communities, the corpus linguistics community, the language teaching community, the OER community, and it was like they were all sort of talking on in different frequency waves, different channels, and trying to find an interface between those channels to see how we could share these resources. Um, I was with the SCORE project at the Open University in the UK. It's the support center for open resources and education. And I was with other um, people working across UK universities looking at OER, and these were the areas that I was focused on for my fellowship. Um, two years ago, I was at Cambridge 2012, and this is a, I was reporting back on an OER cascade study at Durham University with language teachers. Um, so we looked at different tools, actually. We looked at the Flex project, which I'm involved in, and I asked the, student, uh, the teachers and the students to feed back on that tool. And we looked at other tools out there as well. Um, so some of the things that came up were specificity in language. So really looking at the language of different domains rather than looking broadly across academic language. Um, so, I mean, I think there is this mis misconception or misperception of um, English for academic purposes being really focused on generic skills, writing an essay, developing an argument. These things are important, but it's not the whole depth of the language that students actually have to encounter across their different subject areas. And of course, we looked at interface design. And um, the, the critical point that came up was it was actually quite hard to build these resources from our OER cascade into their existing programs. They were quite happy for us to do a little side study, a little pilot, where we got students into labs and we showed them the tools and we got feedback. But to actually embed that approach into the programs um, wasn't possible, and so that's one of those critical junctures um, that I will write about in writing up my PhD research. Uh, this is just an exchange between myself and one of the teachers. She's talking about um, a specific language with a student, a geology student, and she makes this point, um, why don't we have each student looking at their subject-specific collocation set? So collocations are words that form in patterns around um, particular terms. So for example, um, here with a search term, the aging population, um, structure, age structure of the population. So th this is a collocational pattern around aging population. And, and the, the learners that were involved in that study found that very useful. We set up a, um, a task where um, they, they were able to search, up, search this term, aging population, and half of the group had the flex tool, and they were bringing in a lot more of these related collocations in their essay writing, whereas those that hadn't had the experience with the flex tool they were just looking at articles. We gave them five articles on the aging population. And what tended to happen in their writing was they just said, aging population, blah, 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 the aging population. So they kept repeating that same term over and over again, whereas um, the students who'd looked at these collocations and related terms were actually flexibly using um, aging population and all the terms that go around it. So we thought that that was quite a good result just as a pilot study. Um, this is another teacher, Jeff. He, was in, he has an engineering background, okay, and, and he was really interested in the um, design feedback to the FLAX program. So I'll just forward over. With Oxford, what they wanted me to do was to um, promote their OER podcasts um, across international um, contexts. 
And so we're looking at podcasts, but also at Oxford, they have the Oxford Text Archive and they manage large corpora, um, including, um, I'll just jot it, that was just some um, methodology really. I just did an ethnographic approach, um, narratives, thick descriptions. And, and what came out of that was uh, we had this large corpus at Oxford that was managed by Oxford, Oxford called the British, um, sorry, I didn't put it in there, British Academic Written English Corpus. And that's a learner corpus taken from three universities across the UK of approximately two and a half thousand um, examples of learner writing. And, and what the developers of the corpus did, Nessie and Gardner, was they came up with 13 different genres of academic writing. So not just the essay, you had other genres as well. And what we wanted to do with the FLEX um, project with Oxford was to open up that corpus so it wasn't just there, you know, sitting in the archive, being accessed by researchers, but we really wanted to open it up for learners and teachers as well. So we came up with different um, tools. Tomorrow I'm actually going to be presenting more on the tools side of FLAX, um, doing more demonstrations. Today I'm talking more about the research. That's just a training video about that corpus in FLAX. Here are some of the podcasts from Oxford and FLAX. Um, it's just a, a blog post from Oxford talking about what I was trying to do in terms of promoting their resources in international contexts where there is a large demand for English. At the moment, I'm at the research hub at the OU, the OER research hub, and I'm looking at different hypotheses. You can check these hypotheses out on the OER research hub website, and they're very keen for people to reuse their data collection instruments, their surveys and questions and so on. Um, and so when I um, do the data analysis on my research, I will feed it back and link it back to their hypotheses and, as well, and their OER impact map. And they would love for other people to put their OER research on their impact map as well. Uh, that's just a post I did about my time at um, the OU OER Research Hub, talking about educating in beta, because as a developer of software, in that group, and that team. Um, we're always putting things out before they're ready, so things are in the sort of perpetual beta stage. Um, and that's a term from the open source software community, um, this perpetual beta. So anybody that's got Gmail or has used Flickr, you'll remember that, that beta logo that's always there. Um, this is a MOOC um, on virology at, at Coursera. And just to show you that the, the language from natural sciences is very specific. I mean, it's not everyday English. And what we've taken from this MOOC is podcasts, video transcripts, academic blog posts, um, research articles. This man, um, Vincent Racaniello, um, wants to be Earth's virology professor. And I think he's really achieving his goal because uh, he's a prolific digital scholar in terms of blogging. And every week he has a podcast talking about some virus issue. He has these great um, debates with, you know, writers in the New York Times saying, you know, you've got your information wrong about this virus. You're creating unnecessary fear. And there will, there'll be this back and forth. And I think that's wonderful um, criticality that he's sharing with his students at Columbia. And he's been um, hugely successful in iTunes University and now in Coursera as well. So we're creating a language collection out of his uh, MOOC resources um, for his um, students, and that just shows you the specificity of the language here. A variolation, I mean, honestly, if you ask any English speaker, they would not know what that term means. Um, but here in Flax, it will sort of search through and link it up with Wikipedia, Wiktionary, and so it's giving students a conceptual as well as a terminology resource in one place. The possibilities, um, we can get trace data on students' use. We might get a learner survey. At the moment, I don't have an interface with Coursera. I have an interface with him. Um, but in terms of being able to get your instruments out there and being used, I don't have that access at this point. So that may or may not happen. But what, what would be an okay case scenario is for me to interview with the virology um, professor and his TAs and also to collect passive data or trace data about the use of the system, uh, what was accessed by students and so on. Uh, I'm also doing this other collections building with teachers at a university in London called Queen Mary. Same type of idea, but here we're looking at law 
and I'm almost there, I'm on the last slide now. Um, so they're involved in collecting a lot of open resources, so open access articles, law, case, research reports, and so on. Um, and so that's teacher development. It's also, we're gonna do stuff with the learners as well. So there's data that I'm collecting now, and there's also data that I'm just sort of putting aside for later. And these are the references. Thank you for your patience for following me through to the end. Thank you.